Hello, and welcome to the Southern Ontario Gothic Tour. Welcome, also, to my room, from which we will be conducting the Southern Gothic Tour today. You probably have a few questions. What is the Southern Ontario Gothic Tour? Southern Ontario Gothic is something you may be familiar with as a genre of literature which shares many of the preoccupations of all Gothic literature, morally ambiguous characters, morbid fascinations, and tentatively supernatural events. For me, a Southern Ontario Gothic tour meant going to allegedly haunted locations across Ontario and seeing if I could find ghosts. Sometimes I went alone, sometimes I went with others, and then I wrote poems about it. Second question you may have is who is Jade Wallace? Unfortunately, I don't find that question extremely interesting, so I'm just gonna skip it. And if you want, you can read my bio at the end of this video. Otherwise, let's just move on. Did I ever actually see a ghost? Well, you're gonna have to come on the tour with me and find out. Let's begin. Have you ever been to a tourist town in the off season? It's kind of creepy and desolate, but you know what's creepier is a ghost town that's completely abandoned and all of the buildings are kind of dilapidated and you're not entirely sure if there's anyone around, but probably not, and you're kind of frankly hoping not. This first poem is about both of those things. Shudder. In autumn, there is no apparent difference between tourist towns and ghost towns. Windows are shuttered, grit gathers on porches, grass pushes at every crack. A handful of trailers still run electricity because some people can't afford another home. But you and I know these towns are not the same in any season. In the tourist towns, we walk the sleepy shore and watch lightning strike the middle of the lake. You take a photo of me surrounded by seagulls. I take a photo of every store with a dirty name. I heart BJ's, Nut and Fudge, Big Willies. When we pass other wanderers, we nod and leave each other to our solitude. In the ghost towns, we don't stop the car. We only drive, voyeuristic and slow, keeping our camera in the back seat. Our eyelids click like shutters to capture this road that has no white lines, overhead wires, or street signs. The leaves are so thick above us that we can't see the color of the sky. When we go, we note a certain coldness in the wind, let out breaths that we've been superstitiously holding. We'll never admit our preference for death. I was very tempted to use all of the signs I came across in my travels with some kind of filthy connotation in this poem, but I refrained. Instead, here is a selection of photos, including both the signs named in the poem, as well as a few others. My personal favorite is Sticky Fingers, although that one was from Sarnia, not from a deserted beach town, which is why I decided not to include it. And this is simply a photo of a very desolate particular beach in autumn. This one happens to be with Sega Beach, although it's very typical of its type. The next poem is about how unsettling it can be to lose your own family history. That's probably all you really need to know about it. The cemetery in question is located in Hamilton, Ontario. Nothing comes from nowhere. There are numbers in your hand that should tell us where your grandfather is buried. Section 28, you say. I ask if you're sure. Beyond 14 is an empty field. You shove the paper in your back pocket and we spend the next two hours reading every stone. Some share your name, but none of them are your grandfather. We drive back and forth down the adjoining road, fidgeting with the map looking for the rumored second half of the cemetery, but it remains elusive as a cryptid. You can't find your grandfather's grave, like you can't be sure of your grandmother's real name, because even if you weren't avoiding your father, who tries sometimes to kill you, there is not one living member of your estranged family who would admit 
what kind of school your grandmother might have been forced into, or what became of her parents. It must be unsettling for a trained historian like you to be unable to find the archive that can show you your own bloodline. You've consulted librarians and miracle workers, but your origins are still as unknown as those of the fingernail gouges you found on the ceiling of your bedroom one morning after dreaming you were a raven. Next, we have two whole poems about Hagersville, Ontario. Sometimes I wonder if anyone's written about Hagersville, Ontario in poetry. I mean, it's kind of really boring to drive through in an objective sense, but at the same time, I'm strangely fascinated by it. And so, two poems. Here's the first. Haggard. There is a town that is famous only for an inferno of car tires that burned for 17 days, which is basically eternity by the metric of TV news. We drive through the town, trying to discern its most important parts. We are looking for the biggest buildings, the most sprawling parking lots, the highest density of human traffic. We find only two locations that matter, the gypsum mine and the asylum. We spiral outward, looking for a third. All we find is the next town. Hagersville does also have probably a few churches, although this is the only one I recall. It does seem to lean a little bit ominously, but there's not much else to see in Hagersville, so you might as well enjoy the view. This next poem touches a little bit on the colonial history of the area around Hagersville. It's really not unlike the history and the atrocities that were committed across Ontario and Canada and that are still ongoing. You'll notice that the title I say out loud is not the same as the title that's on the screen. The reason for that is the title of the poem actually incorporates the original Cayugan word for the area around Hagersville, what we now call Hagersville because it has been renamed by settlers. I'm not adept at Cayugan pronunciation, so I'm not going to butcher their language, but you will see it on the screen. Humans under Hagersville. Above the Sabka, the plain salt crusted as sea coast, there is lightning white gypsum that shears through shadowy dolomite rock. The footpaths of miners run atop the stone, winding outward and upward until they reach a cluster of industrial buildings. Roads sprawl from the heart of the Hagersville mines like thoughtless limbs, while the trees back slowly away. Over the sleeping West Mine, six Iroquois nations share a 5% pittance of the land they were promised by the British two centuries ago as a reward, they were told, for their loyalty. On the southern side, the town of Hagersville is known for the time that it, accidentally, set 10 million tires blazing. They say it took firefighters 17 days to quell the toxic smoke, but 25 years later, it still grows inside them. Cancer swells in their blood, their bladders, their brains. In the hospital, the white walls are made of gypsum, and some patients swear the tap water has the dolorous taste of waste rock that finally leached all the way to the lake. This, as you can probably tell, is not Hagersville, it is Townsend, but they're in the same county, and Townsend, I felt, deserved a little special place here. Not really worth writing a poem about, but I do like to imagine that the children of Townsend, as you can see on the sign, uh, are kind of like children of the corn and probably have their own little knockoff horror novel. You'll notice a few poems in this tour about motels. I really love small, low-rent, family-owned, carefully tended motels, and there are so many of them across southern Ontario. Not such a big fan of the company that I'm not going to name, but you all know what it is, and they basically turn homes into vacation spots, and it destroys rental housing, and it's kind of terrible. 
don't really like participating in that. Uh, but there are motels and hostels and they can be kind of great. So a few poems about how cool and idiosyncratic tiny motels in tiny towns can be. The Innkeeper's Curse In Delhi, Ontario, which really could not be less like Delhi, India, there is a woman who runs a motel out of an office that adjoins her family's apartment. While we are paying for our room, one of her children comes in through their door, carrying a dog-eared copy of Around the World with the Word Gang, and asks her mother to read to her. Books abandoned on other nights form colorful layers in the sediment of invoices on the desk. The woman hugs her daughter, but goes on asking us more questions than a Greek philosopher about every city we've seen on our trip, as if the turmeric we can smell simmering in her kitchen has left her ravenous for a world she cannot go out to meet, because she has to wait for it to come to her, in pieces of mail, in deliveries of Egyptian cotton, in the bodies of globe-trotting travelers who expect someone to keep the motel open every day of the year. I can't say that I'm a person of many talents, and the talents I do have are decidedly specific and not extraordinarily useful in daily life. Uh, for example, I'm very good at making coleslaw. I'm also very good at finding cheap motels that are wonderfully clean and the owners are super polite and lovely. Uh, so while I know that many motels exist that probably kind of make you feel the way this image makes you feel, that has not been my experience. What would a gothic road trip, or really any road trip, be without getting lost? This poem is about getting lost. Well, kind of. I mean, it's a gothic poem, so nothing is really ever as it seems. Dead Reckoning. Wherever we are in southwestern Ontario, Port Rowan is always under a hundred kilometers away, always an estimated hour or less drive through farms to the lake on the edge of twilight, no matter how long we travel towards it or how many times we stare incredulously at the map, at road signs, at each other. The first time we try to drive the hundred clicks, we give up after six hours and go home instead. The second time, we resign ourselves to inefficient wayfinding, managing the half-hour drive in a mere five. We walk empty Bacchus Village in the dark. Old farm machines loom over us with gears that look like they could grind bones. No one yells at us to leave, though I start to wish someone would, just to reassure us it is possible. When we get back to the car, our headlights only deepen the shadows between the trees. I turn to you and ask, what lies our map telling now? And so this was our first sight of Bacchus Village. Extremely inviting, as you can see at twilight with no humans around for several kilometers. And here was one of the farm machines that distinctly alarmed me with a human next to it just for scale. And finally this is about how dark it got before we finally decided to turn around and leave. But before we did we had to walk through the creepy century-old cemetery and go back to our car and drive away very quickly. There's not really a lot I need to say about this poem. It's basically going to take you through a history of the place it's talking about. What I will say is that the place I'm referring to is the former Alma College in St. Thomas, Ontario. You have to expect fires. First it was a girls school. Then it was a horror film set, and finally it was forsaken. When a building is haunted by silence, you have to expect that unexplained fires 
will fill its cathedral arches and bring it to collapse. By the time we get there, purple verbena is growing in the hill of split bricks that remains. I leave you staring at a chain link fence and cross a long stretch of pale arid rubble to a copse of trees reaching their arms up out of the ravine whose slope glows with chlorophyll and sunlight. Rocks, half buried in leaf litter, are making arcane patterns on the ground, like crop circles, like Nazca lines, like the seats and stage of an outdoor theater that fire cannot touch. No young spirits wander, but birds walk the earth miming field mice and reciting soliloquies for low-lying plants. After showing you many photos that have nothing to do with the poem that precedes them, at last, here we have the purple verbena growing in the hill of split bricks that remains. This is about all that's left of a girls' school in St. Thomas. This and this steeple. Now, another of the motel poems. The Gemini Proprietors. There is a man who runs a small motel in St. Thomas. He is the doppelganger of a man who runs a smaller motel in Kingston. Both of them sound confused on the phone when I try to book a room, as if they don't do that sort of thing often. They are in their fifties, have arms like dried plant stalks, wear glasses from the sixties, and pull long cobweb hair tight under baseball caps. Their motel offices are cramped attics, showcasing a vacuum cleaner older than the Great Depression a globe that still believes in Ceylon. The twins move somehow slower than time. I learned to identify and end child abuse from a lavender brochure made during the last millennium before they have even finished writing out my license plate number. I pass hours admiring their paintings of wolves framed in gold-colored plastic while they try to rustle up a key for a thrifty, immaculate room. This is, fortunately, not what either of the motels look like, uh, just a great abandoned wall. You have to really appreciate an abandoned wall that's decaying in a really artful way. Let's look at it for a moment. This poem might make it sound like I hate London, Ontario. But only a small part of me hates London, Ontario. The rest of me, well, is completely indifferent to London, Ontario. I guess it's not that bad of a city, all things considered. I don't know. Anyways, London. Maps of the Forest City. One. In London, Ontario, world serial killer capital 59 to 84, I go into a convenience store and ask if they carry maps of London. It doesn't have a map, the clerk says, and he probably means that the store doesn't stock the map, but it sounds like cartographers have forsworn the city. 2. Wellington Street is not Wellington Road, is not Wellington Crescent, but they are all annexed to each other. I want to know why the city can't come up with a new name. And you say, because they called themselves London and they called their river Thames. 3. Don't think that you have found a bank just because you see a six foot tall sign that says bank. 4. Down the street from the all night payday loan shop, there is a hotel with nouveau riche chandeliers the size of small cars. 5. Where is the forest? Where is the forest? An 
urban forest is not a forest. An urban forest is a park. An urban forest is a boulevard. An urban forest is an insoluble paradox. 6. London is not wholly without wonder. There is a bookstore, which was once described as having cool things, especially on the top and bottom floors, but also on the middle floor. Cool things on every floor, then. Three levels of cool. A triple scoop ice cream cone. There is an indoor market called, of course, Covent Garden. It is old as 1845, good enough for a theater and an art school. The market carries postcards, fresh crepes, and living stones. I'd buy a living stone if I wanted a reminder of how it felt to be here. This is a majestic view of a place in southern Ontario. That place is not London. This is, however, what an actual forest city would look like. I hope you all are appreciating the efforts I'm going to to give you a different view of my room every time I appear in this video. Um, anyways, I currently live in Windsor, Ontario. This next poem is about Windsor, Ontario, but it was written when I came a few years before I lived here. It was technically part of one of the road trips. I'm not entirely sure why we came to Windsor. I guess I have a friend here. Still only have one friend here. It's okay. Anyways, we did come across some haunted places accidentally in Windsor, so that was pretty neat. This is a poem about the place I lived before I lived here. Impenetrable. By the time we reach Edgewater Beach, the fog is so thick we could be anywhere on earth. We see no shore, only the road under us heading south, until we make out a sign for a fort. We've never heard of it, but we stop, because forts, by their nature, must be haunted, even if they are now surrounded by quaint suburban bungalows. It is a fort known, when at all, for being a place where Tecumseh and Brock devised one whole strategy. After it housed soldiers, it held veterans on pensions. Later still, it contained the overflow of quiet chronics from the Toronto Asylum. By the time we get to it, the only people occupying the fort are a couple making out next to the no swimming sign and a groundskeeper who does not approve of the company. I try to remember the last time I kissed you. We do not stay long, but leave the lovers to their fate at the rubber-gloved hands of the caretaker, who is in no danger of leaving fingerprints at a crime scene. We are now in my closet. You may have noticed an interesting phrase in that piece, quiet chronics. It's a very antiquated expression, obviously comes from psychiatric and medical discourse, and it was used to refer to people who were patients of psychiatric facilities who were considered mentally ill, but who were not really a danger to themselves or others. Why they remained institutionalized? Well, I'm sure you can fill in those historic gaps yourself. Anyways, sometimes quiet chronics got to live on their own, away from purportedly violent offenders, and they lived in places like Fort Malden, where they could cluster and not be a danger to literally anyone. Anyways, isn't psychiatric institutionalization fraught. On the left in this photo, we have one of the buildings of Fort Malden. I confess, I do not really care what it is. On the right, we have my favorite part of Fort Malden, which is this sign that states the incredibly obvious. Now, I want to play you a song. No, I'm just kidding. We're not playing a song. Uh, we're going to hear a poem about the Black Donnelly homestead in Lucan, Ontario. You may have heard of the Black Donnellys, maybe not. Anyways, they basically were all murdered, or almost all murdered, a century and a half ago in a vigilante justice scenario. 
It still generates a surprising amount of controversy considering it happened 140 years ago, but I guess people around here really like their history, and so the Donnelly Homestead, which I don't actually really recommend you visit. This next story is completely true. Cabbage Head If a man walks out of his house, grim and purposeful, carrying a large head of cabbage, if a man refuses to look at you while you're idling in his driveway, if a man throws a large head of cabbage into a cornfield with surprising fury, slide your gear shift into reverse, roll your tires slowly over the stones, and turn 90 degrees until you are back on a dirt road going anywhere else. Don't try to catch the man's eye. Don't ask why the chain holding the private property sign is lying on the ground under a tree. No matter what the internet told you about tours, no matter how much you want to stand on the bones of a homestead calling the names of a whole ruined family. And here's a photo of a field that isn't actually in Lucan, but it looks remarkably as if it is. This next poem is about a museum. Kind of. I mean, it's not quite a museum. You'll see what I mean. Anyways, it's in Sarnia, Ontario, and though I don't name the museum, you can probably figure out what it is from reading or hearing the poem. I'm not going to not recommend you go, but I'm also definitely not going to recommend you go. I don't know. Maybe you should just hear the poem. Skeleton Museum The man acting like he's in charge calls it a museum, but the only educational artifact I've seen is a poster of the solar system that hangs on the wall across from the toilet, which I noticed when I was looking around nervously and trying to take a piss. The facilities were big and sterile as a doctor's office, and I was half expecting to find myself staring down the beady eye of either a hidden camera or a stranger coming in through the inexplicable second door. The man acting like he's in charge must be a con artist or a thief. He has collected millions in semi-precious gemstones and taxidermied animals, donated, he claims, by dying friends and do-gooders. But the non-profit corporate structure he describes sounds more like a tax evasion scheme that lets him spend his retirement glorifying himself to people like you, who won't stop encouraging him to talk, partly because you love a conspiracy and partly because he reminds you of your sharp father, who you can never see again, because for 20 years he has wanted to excise imagined sins from your body with a knife. And here is another highly educational artifact from the museum in question, which was not actually called the Skeleton Museum. I have changed the name, slightly at least, which I feel is polite to do when you are insulting someone. The title slide you saw, with the polar bear looking like it's kind of in a rave, that was also actually directly from the museum. There are a surprising number of towns in Ontario that share my surname. I mean, there are two, but that's a surprising number. I wouldn't expect there would even be two. There's Wallace Town and Wallace Burke. This poem is about Wallace Town, which is the vastly superior of the two, although neither are particularly glamorous. Anyways, Wallace Town. Cattails. We are heading southwest to Grand Bend, and the sun is making the fields look full of buttercups when I swing a hard U-turn to take us down a road promising a village with your surname. Your territory is five streets, a couple dozen houses, a school, and a church that's for sale. We survey every square of grass for graves of your ancestors and find nothing but corn. You don't need family, I tell you in the motel room that night. 
I'll buy you the church and you can start a cult. A few days later, we coast serendipitously through a town named For My Forebearers. It's just off the shore of Lake Erie and populated mostly by reeds. There is a gas station, though, and a cafe called Tall Tales, where all visitors are required to be either silent or silver-tongued. We don't go in, and we don't stay long in town, but I swear I'll go back and build myself a ramshackle shelter on the edge of Buttermilk Bog. And this is the real Tall Tales Cafe. As far as I know, they don't require you to lie to get in, but I also didn't check, so maybe they do. And here we have the sign for Buttermilk Bog, which is indeed a real place despite its fanciful name. I preface this next poem by saying that I have absolutely nothing against cows. Cows are extremely gentle, entirely faultless creatures, and I'm sorry I maligned them so much in this poem. It takes place in Manitoulin Island. I'm not actually certain that there are an unusual number of cows on Manitoulin Island, but there certainly seemed to be when I was there. Might be a perceptual thing. I don't know. Anyways, the cows of Manitoulin Island. Trust not the cow. On this island, there are more cows than human beings. No domesticated ungulates these hardly recognizable as the progeny of 10,000 years of breeding. The cows are wholly feral, shaggy and ragged, sheltered by thick groves of trees, strangers to any barn. They keep their milk for themselves. We do not take faith in their gentle eyes. We do not rely on their short legs. We keep a car door between us. These cows know all too well that their domain is gateless, unbounded, measured not by acres, but by infinities. Okay, this one does not have anything to do with cows. It's not even taken in the place where the cows were. But I love this sign. It's sitting here on this backwoods road, which is cracked and narrow and winds slowly up the side of a mountain overgrown with trees and you think looking at the sign who the fuck would try to drive on this road anyways who is it keeping out i wanted to go to plum hollow since i first started reading about hauntings in ontario there isn't much of a mythology of haunting in plum hollow there is however a mythology around mother barnes who is a witch kind of and a tassiomancer, so of course I wanted to go. I took a solo road trip. It's out in southeastern Ontario, sort of towards Kingston. And Plum Hollow is not really a town so much as it is a collection of rural roads. Nothing is really marked. If you want to find something, you just kind of drive around until you see it. So her homestead was fairly easy to find. But when I looked for her grave, what happened was I went to one cemetery looked around all the stones, read every single one. You may notice a pattern here, that is something I do. Didn't find her grave. What I did see was a large black dog that looked like an omen of death. So I left. I went to another cemetery and the last stone I saw was indeed her grave. And then I saw another large black dog looking like a second omen of death. So again, I left. Nevertheless, it was one of my favorite road trips I've ever been on, and I would totally go again. Plum Hollow. Dauntless, she eloped across the widest water, tiding restless at the edge of Innisfail's green, with her soldier fallen penniless from the sky. Her father called her a sucker who salts her tea, but she, seventh daughter of a seventh daughter, was led by the clouded omens of a third eye. In three years, there were quarters on her lover's eyes. She cried until Ontario lakes were Mediterranean water, dreamt of cursing the land and its sons and daughters. She could shear hair to bind tree roots and choke their green, brew pits of plums into a bitter almond tea, 
pitch a black veil to banish sunlight from the sky. But she was no witch with wrath enough for the sky, so she turned back to the earth with a mortal eye and found her son had no pennies even for tea. She wed and moved nearer Temperance's water. Her husband, once a cobbler, now sowing a green harvest that could feed their coming sons and daughters. One day he left, taking two sons and no daughter, for no reason she could find writ in land or sky. When her children hungered for any kind of green, she again summoned visions from a higher eye. She saw one gambit holding them above water, and it was treading over a seabed of tea. All tomorrows were hence drafted in dregs of tea. For a quarter she could foretell crops, find lost daughters. Once, because she sensed a corpse hidden near water, a man burned in the chair as if stricken by the sky. Once she read for a man whose sheep slipped from his eyes, led him to their skinned bodies on a neighbor's green. When she died, they laid her corpse beneath deepest green, scattered the earth with her remaining leaves of tea. She was her bloodline's last tassiomancing eye, for she never delivered a seventh daughter. Cheesemakers laid a stone for her beneath the sky, while clouds saw her leaves were dry and poured out water. On her houses green, empty now of son or daughter, Dust gathers in place of tea beneath a parting in the sky. Visitors come with two eyes only, holding no coin or water. Before I ever went to see the grave of the Witch of Plum Hollow, I actually read about her in this book here, and it has this really lovely quote, possibly one of my favorite quotes. She was Mrs. Elizabeth Barnes, Mother Barnes, or the Witch of Plum Hollow. Of course, she was not a witch, and she did not live in Plum Hollow. This is the final poem about motels. It's also the final poem of the evening. I say it's about motels, but it's also kind of a meditative piece about the liminal spaces we occupy when we're traveling and away from home. And it's also kind of about capitalism, because why not? Anyways, hope you enjoy it. The Lost Rooms We drive eight hours a day, scavenge french fries and spaghetti from family diners, then lock ourselves in our motel rooms and marvel at the nostalgia of cable TV. At night, our lives back home are nothing more to us than one of yesterday's reruns. The world is only the strip of highway that we can see through the gap in the curtains. Some nights, when I can't sleep, I take bills out of my wallet and spread them across a desk. I don't count them. I sit quietly and resent every dollar for being so small. Money is the only hitch that keeps us from disappearing. This is a sneaky cheating photo. It was not taken by me. It is not even in Ontario. It's in rural New Brunswick, it's the house that my grandmother grew up in, but it does look creepy and gothic, doesn't it? Also, the person who took the photo is probably dead. You may still be wondering, did I ever see a ghost? No, I did not. I've been waiting since I was four years old to see a ghost, and I'm still waiting. I do, however, have a really great cat. There are still some remaining notes and acknowledgements and the like in this video and you are of course welcome to stay tuned, but otherwise, this is the end. We have made it through the Southern Ontario Gothic Tour together. Thank you so much for joining me. As a reward, a little bit of sunlight. The poems that comprise the Southern Ontario Gothic Tour were originally written with the financial support of the Ontario Arts Council. The Southern Ontario Gothic Tour film and chapbook were made possible by financial assistance from the City of Windsor's Arts, Culture, and Heritage Fund. And 
Just as important as the financial support is the moral support I've received from a number of people who I would like to acknowledge. Thank you, as always, to my mother, Lori Wallace, for her love and her company and for letting me use some of her photos in this film and chapbook. Thank you to Terry Trowbridge, who knows too much and is therefore an ideal fellow traveler. And thank you to my partner, Mark LaLiberty, who patiently discusses all of my grant applications and all of my manuscripts with me. He also designed the cover that is used in the film and this chapbook. Thank you so much to all of you. And just a couple of quick notes on the poems. <laughs> 